we are recording another, another lecture. I guess it's easier to just show up and, and talk, but I don't really want to share. And so we'll do this for at least Tuesday and see how Wednesday goes. One of my colleagues was like, yeah, I can get rid of the microphone. I'm like, eh, this pandemic isn't over. You never know when you're going to be doing that. All right, anyway, we're going to be talking about symbolic execution now. And this is the first part of the more formal verification content of this course. And so it's going to be pretty different in flavor from what we've seen before. But you'll see that that builds on the, the testing related content we talked about today. All right, <clears throat> here's a motivating example. So remember, there's this program foo that we talked about before. And this foo just does a division. It's kind of a dumb program. But anyway, what we're talking about now is let's look at this program. And the question is, and this is a rhetorical, rhetorical question, so you can guess what the answer is, but it seems too good to be true. So we're going to automatically generate a test suite. And that's OK, whatever. We've talked about the pitfalls of automatically generating test suites. But this test suite is going to achieve full branch coverage, discover whether division by zero is possible, and identify all infeasible test requirements like dead code. And the answer is yes. And so we'll talk about the technique that we use to do that. All right. So here's what it looks like in brief. We have symbolic execution technique we're going to use. And the way it works is like this. First of all, we're going to add explicit tests. So you can see that there's assert, which says assert y is not equal to 0. In this case, it's an implicit specification anyway that we want to check divide by 0. But we're going to make it explicit here and say explicitly assert y is not equal to 0 if we're going to divide by it. And so what we're going to say is we're going to look for explicit assertion violations. Then we're going to traverse the program to compute each program path. And so we'll have an example there. But basically, you have a bunch of paths that you explore. You want to explore all the paths that are different with respect to what you care about. Then the question is, how do you drive execution into each path? And so we've talked about getting complete you know, uh, <coughs> coverage of the program. And so now we're going to try to make sure that we do that. And we're going to do that automatically, as it turns out. And so the secret sauce here is a constraint, a constraint solver, and the one we use is Z3. And so it's going to magically, given a set of constraints, come up with a set of inputs that is going to satisfy that set of constraints. So now we have a bunch of inputs. And we have, in fact, that bunch of inputs is a complete bunch of inputs. And we're going to run the program on all the inputs. So it sounds like testing, right? It's like we're just running it on a bunch of inputs. But no, in fact, this is pretty good. It's a bunch of inputs that is going to guarantee that if you run it on all the inputs that you've generated, you are going to not violate or not violate the conditions that you, you've identified. And so what we have here is all testing is automatic. It has complete coverage, but it, in fact, explores all the possible situations where that invariant or where the property that the asserts identify might be false. All right, so so there's two things here. Um, so there's the thing of traversing and the thing of solving. These are the two things that we should go into a bit more detail in. And so the thing about traversing is that we're going to automatically explore program paths, all program paths. And in these program paths, we're going to explore, execute the program on so-called symbolic input values. And we talked about this last week. And so instead of saying x is 5, we're going to say x is actually capital X for our notation. And just keep on writing the program and don't actually know what x is, but it's OK. Then we're going to fork the execution under the branch. And we're going to record the branching conditions. OK, so that's how we traverse the, the conditions. And then the next part is to solve constraints. So what we're going to do is we're going to decide path feasibility. And so we're going to. If it, at the same time, we're going to decide path feasibility and generate test cases for paths and find potential bugs. So it's it's actually pretty concrete. 
and so it's you know formal verification blah 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 but no in the end what you get is you get an actual input for the program which is going to identify the bug all right so let's look at an example of traversing the past so what we have here again is boom and so I'm going to say there's there's four paths here. Okay. So what defines a path? Well, first of all, we have the if statement, which we can see here, and the if statement says if x is greater than y. Okay. So the first part of the path says, okay, we do this condition if x is greater than y, and we're actually going to fork. So we're going to explore the case where x is greater than y, and we're going to explore the case where not x is greater than y, as if x is less than or equal to y. So the first path condition starts with x is greater than y. That's going to be the first one. And then we have another logical predicate here. And that predicate says y is not equal to 0. And so we can have the first path, which is if x is greater than y and y equals 0, then what happens is the assertion fails. On the other hand, if y is not equal to 0, then the execution of the program reaches the return statement, return x divided by y. And note that what we have here is, in fact, that we know for a fact that if the execution reaches um, the return statement, then it's not going to fail. The failure will have been caught by the assertion. Same thing with the other branch, so x is less than equal to y. OK, so that's all the paths. And so if failure happens, it's going to happen on one of these paths. OK, so these paths are still abstract, right? So all I'm saying about a path is, well, you reach this path if x is greater than y. OK, fine. But how do we actually do that? And so that's the second part of the secret sauce. And so the second part says, what we do is we generate a set of constraints, and then we ask this magic Z3 tool, which you're going to use in this class, but you're not going to understand really how it works. That's another course. And so the idea there is to ask Z3 to solve these constraints for us. And so for our purposes, it's going to be magic. Uh, we can we can experiment with it though. And so let's let's try Z3 on this example, which is one of the paths. It's the path where x is greater than y and um, y is not equal to zero. All right, let's run this now. So I've already typed in this program. And so it says it uses prefix notation, so assert x is greater than y, and y is not equal to zero. And so let's let's check satisfiability and pass for the model. C3 xy dot c3. And boom, it says, yep, that is satisfiable. If you say y is one and x is two, then it's going to meet the assertions that we have. So is x greater than y? X is two, y is one, yes. Is y not equal to 0? Y is 1. All right. So yes, there is, in fact, a model which reaches that path. This is somewhat unsatisfying as an example because, uh, OK, so if, if you have y equals 0, then the assertion fails, and x can be anything, we could feed that to z3. But it's really pretty easy to imagine a situation like that, right? Um, like, like you say, x is 1, y equals 0. If you didn't really ask well, z3 once, we will talk about next time using Z3 in more complicated examples though. All right, so what's the history of this? So people thought about this a while ago, right? And we have old white men talking about this. And so there's papers from the International Conference on Reliable Software in 1975, a new approach to program testing, and Boyer, Elspass, and Levitt talk about a formal system for testing debugging programs by symbolic execution. So this idea is not new. People thought about it. There's two things that are new here, I'd say. The first thing is Z3 and other solvers of that sort make this actually feasible. And the other thing, which we are totally not talking about in this class, but which is a thing, is being able to reason about uh, programs in the heap. And so actually, in the 70s, they had a lot of these good verification ideas. But as soon as you started throwing pointers at them, then it's like, Meh, too hard. We we just don't know. We're just gonna pretend there's no pointers. So you you can look at a lot of literature from the seventies and it seems pretty good, but it turns out there's this huge gap in it that means means that you can't actually apply it. 
pointers are still hard, but we have approaches now that mitigate the uh, the difficulty of pointers, and we also have languages like Rust, which make a lot of pointers unique, and that makes things easier as well. But again, this is beyond the topic of this course, and we're not going to talk about it too much. And so back then, there's a quote that says, recent work on proving the correctness of programs was great promise and appears to be the ill fit technique for producing reliable programs. Our really practical accomplishments in 1975 in this area fall short of a tool for routine use. Fundamental problems are not likely to be solved in any immediate future. Yeah, that's like almost 50 years ago. So yeah, there we are. All right, so yeah, what happened? What happened was SAT and F the SMT solver. And so you can download, I just went apt install Z3 and look, I have Z3 and I can solve a lot of these problems. Like when I was in school in the nineties, people were like, SAT, that's hard. We can't solve SAT, but now SAT, it's still theoretically hard, but in practice, you can solve a lot of problems. And so these classic algorithms were decidable, but uh, decidable enough, but you couldn't actually solve them. And so you could solve a lot of problems that you couldn't solve before. There's also conceptual breakthroughs, um, which we will actually talk about this term about dynamic symbolic execution. And so that that helped as well. So there were stuff people knew in the 70s, but there were all stuff also stuff people didn't know. And we'll talk about that. All right, so we have a bunch of examples of symbolic execution. Um, I showed you one before. Here's another one. Um, basically, I'm just going to show you different parts of it, and eventually it'll make sense if you think about it harder. Okay, so let's look at this example. So we have we have the max with four numbers, and then it calls max with two numbers. I guess it would have been better to call it max four or max two. Okay, anyway, what we want to verify is this function that does max on four numbers. It's going to call max on two numbers and then max on two numbers. And we're going to color code this to indicate which, which, which is which. Okay. There's going to be this concept which where PC before meant program counter. From here on forward, PC is going to mean path condition. And so it's going to be the condition that has to be true to reach any program point. And so here we have PC equals true. That means that you always reach the, the blue point. And then um, if we say A is, OK, so then we look at the decision in the call to max for A and B. So if A is less than or equal to B, so the, the first thing is true, then you hit the, the left branch. And then maybe I should kind of use this. So here, you follow true. And so here, to reach this point, then it's like if A is less than or equal to B. And we look at the next one, which is C and D. And so that we have another max here. And so that tests if C is less than or equal to D. And so let's say it's false. And so the path condition now is A is less than or equal to B and C is greater than D. And so then we can say, for instance, uh, we have one more thing, which is the comparison between the two maxes, and that can be either true or false. Let's say it's true, then we have B is less than or equal to D, and this is a condition that we have for hitting the this branch. So what we have here is we enumerate all the paths that are important with, with respect to the path condition, and then what we're going to do is we're going to ask the SAT solver, given the path condition, to generate an execution which satisfies this path condition. Let's also look at an example where we can run this. So here we have one example. So here we have A, B, C, and D, and we're going to mimic the example we saw before. And so we're now we're going to say they're all um, greater than zero. We're going to say A is less than or equal to B, C is greater than D, and B is greater than D. And so we can see that generates A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 2, D equals 1. And so you can do this for all the examples. And you get a set of test cases, which enumerate, which exhaustively enumerates all of the possible executions of the program, which is really neat. 
is like you can actually generate not just all test cases. You can't generate all test cases. There's too many test cases. However, you can generate all the test cases which are relevant with respect to the paths that the, the program takes. I've first cleverly shown you programs that don't have loops. Loops are hard and we're going to, for the purpose of symbolic execution, not really deal with it. But anyway, that's, that's what we have. Okay. So yeah, Z3 allows you to check past feasibility. We just saw that. Okay, so let's work through another example. And so now our example is this contrived program which says proc and it does various things. So let's let's work through how symbolic execution works on this example. So what we do is at the beginning, we're gonna basically symbolic execution is going to go through the statements of the program and divide the state, fork the state when there's a decision point. So first of all, there's no decisions that have, been making, that have been taken. So as you get past line three, you will always reach past line three if you start running it because there's no there's no conditions. And I have talked last time about symbolic variables. So symbolic variable X or program variable X is going to be symbolic variable big X. Okay, so it's like, it could be anything, it's some input. And we execute R equals zero. Okay, fine. So now what else do we do? So that's a symbolic program state. A symbolic program state includes the path condition PC as well as our values for all the all the variables. And so if you know exactly what it is, like R, then you say it's zero. If you have it as some function of input, right now it's exactly the input, then you say X equals X. So yeah, X is the input symbol. Okay, and yeah, that's a path condition. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we have if x is greater than 8, right? That's the, the first conditional. So there's two possibilities. Either x is greater than 8 or not x is greater than 8. So x is less than or equal to 8. And so we have two possible path conditions here, the true and the false. And right now, nothing else is, is happening. We, we are going to leave the rest of the abstract state as it is. And this is this is all fine. OK. These, these are both possible. Let's continue looking at this. And we're going to execute inside the if. We're going to execute r equals x minus 7. And so then what do we know about r? Well, we know it's the, the, the value symbolic x minus 7. That's, that's exactly what it is. OK, fine. We continue here. There's nothing that happens if x is less than or equal to 8 because there's no else branch. And so we reach if x is less than 5. And so now we have the path condition, which says you get inside the second one um, on this branch if you knew that previously x is greater than 8, and now x is less than 5. You're just listening to this. So, so OK, so so so. I can't really stop and say, okay, tell me, but I can stop and say, tell me. So what, what number is greater than eight and less than five? Nah, there isn't any, right? And so basically you ask that three and it's gonna say, no, there is no number that is greater than eight and less than five. So it's like, no. So you, 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 don't, you don't do this. And remember we were talking about infeasible paths before and I got a couple of questions about that. And so in this case, we actually see that this path is infeasible you can't get into the first branch at line six and then into 10 at the line 10 because that requires contradictory conditions. And so it's just going to give up on that. It's going to say, no, you're, you're, you don't, you never get that. Okay, forget it, went away. Okay, well, it could be false. We're going to use the dotted line to, to indicate false, not the fact that it's on the left or the right. And so the false case says x is greater than eight and x is greater than or equal to five. And so in that case, what we know is x equals x and r equals x minus 7, we don't execute inside the, the, the branch. All right, and basically we continue to, to line 13 and we're going to return r. All right, so now let's consider the case where if you had x was less than or equal to 8, so you skipped the first then branch and you reach the second then. Okay, so now what could happen is, well, you could be false on the first one on the blue and true on the second one on the, on the, on the yellow. Okay, so now x is less than or equal to 8, and x is less than 5. And yes, get 3. Is that OK? Is it all good? All right, so x is x, and r is 0. 
in this branch. And so then you execute the statement in the branch, and then it says r equals x minus 2. OK, so that's that's one possibility. The other possibility is the, 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 the yellow is false. And so you have x equals x and r equals 0. So what we see here is all the possible behaviors of this function. And so we've exhaustively enumerated all the possible behaviors here. Uh, this is symbolic. And so we don't yet know what, what, um, what values for x could be. And there's a lot, but one can argue, and I will argue, that all of the important behaviors are captured by, by these three categories. And then the next thing to do is we can ask Z3, hey, tell us an example of an x that's greater than, greater than 8 and greater than or equal to 5. It's like, OK, x is 9. OK, hey, Z3, tell me about what about x is less than or equal to 8 and less than 5. And Z3 is like, OK, x is 4. And what about x is less than or equal to 8 and greater than or equal to 5. And then Z3 is like, x equals 7. And so here we have these test cases, prop 9, prop 4, and prop 7. And these test cases find all of the possible behaviors of the proc. All right, so what we're doing here is we're doing symbolic execution. So we're doing an analysis of programs by tracking symbolic rather than actual values. And this is a form of static analysis. Uh, at this stage, we run the program through, and that's kind of dynamic, but it's based on static analysis. And so the symbolic reasoning that we're doing, the static analysis, is used to reason about all the inputs that take the same path through the program. And so what we're doing is we're building constraints that characterize conditions for executing paths and the execution effects on the program state. So we're like, OK, we're doing the thing, and we're seeing, well, what, what is the program doing as it executes each of the statements? And so we're collecting symbolic path conditions. So we have these formulas, which are satisfiable if and only if the, the path condition, if the path key is executable. And as I said before, we have this magic constraint solver Z3, and we use it to check if the path condition is satisfiable and the path can be taken. Here's another way of explaining symbolic execution. Um, you have to understand this? Well, no, I guess not. But maybe it'll help you understand what's going on. So basically, we have control flow, flow graph of the program. And it has paths in the control flow graph. So what we're doing is we're creating a functional representation of each path. So we're like, if you take this path through the program, uh, it's going to calculate this function on the input. Right? And so we're, we have some notation here. And so we have paths. And so we have program inputs. And you take the bunch of inputs that, that cause path p to be taken. And we're going to call it d of p. And then there's a computation that uh, that comes when you run path p, and that's what happens. That's c of p. So we can look at we can look at the program as a function from from x to y, from its inputs to its outputs, and so we can split up these space into partial functions corresponding to the executable paths, and so p one up to p r, and each partial function maps some part of the input of the program to to the output. All right, and so then basically we're splitting it up. And so xi is the domain of path pi. They're all disjoint. So um, you ask any two x, any two pi's, and it's like, nope, every input belongs to one and only one um, part of one and one d. And you, you add them all together, and you get the whole domain of the program. <laughs> COVID is best avoided. I, I recommend avoiding it. All right. We are obviously not doing this one take because, well, what happened is that my camera ran out of battery. And then that should be fine. I should be able to record without with sound only. But then somehow it decided to switch the audio input to the camera, which was off. So that's really weird. Anyway, take two. All right, where we managed to, to stop off to get to before the camera rudely died was we were running through an example. And so here's an example of symbolic execution. What we have here is a admittedly contrived program as three <clears throat> branches, which we call blue, yellow, 
and magenta. And there should be obviously pink as well, but there isn't. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to find a violation of the assertion at the end of this procedure. So what we want to do is we're going to try to find some case where x plus y plus z is indeed equal to 3, or a proof that basically, no, you never have any input for which x plus y plus z equals 3. And so we're going to do that with symbolic execution. And so basically, we're going to reason about all the possible inputs to this program. The inputs are a, b, and c, and see if there's any input which can cause the assertion to fail. The initial state has path condition true, because you can always start the thing, and that's true. And we also execute the initial statement x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. OK, so we're going to start running it. And then we see that the first condition is if a. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore the condition where a is true. When a is true, and that's symbolic because it could be either true or false, when it's true, then we execute what's inside it and we set x equal minus 2. OK, so that's one thing that can happen. Um, let's continue exploring and let's see what we, we do. We go in a depth first way and we go and look at the second if yellow. At the second if, what we have is, is b less than 5. And let's continue and explore the true branch. So in the case where you call this procedure with a being true and b being, being less than 5, then you go inside the second branch as well. And so then you have x equals minus 2 y equals 0, x equals 2. So this is one of the paths that we enumerate um, when we traverse the, this, um, this program. And so now we know exactly what x, y, and z are. They're actually concrete. And so we can just compute them. And we can say minus 2 plus 2 is 0, plus 0 is 0. And so x plus y plus z equals 0. The assertion is true. So this, this execution holds. Good. Now let's continue. And let's look at the next execution. This time, we will continue the, breadth, the depth first traversal. And we will say that b is not less than 5. So it's not less than 5, then b is greater than or equal to 5. In this case, we know that x is equal to minus 2, y equals 0, and z equals 0. Because what happens now is we execute inside blue. We do not execute inside yellow. And so nothing happens next. And so x is minus 2, and the others are still 0. And so minus 2 is not equal to 3. So this execution checks out as well, this path. All right, so we continue traversing all the possibilities. And so the next, we've explored everything that might happen when, um, when a is true. So now we continue with a being false. OK, so we start a being false, and then we skip through the first if because nothing happens here. And OK, so now we go to yellow. And let's first of all, we could start either way. But for pedagogical reasons, we will start with yellow being false. And so if yellow is false, then nothing happens at all. We enter 0 of the conditionals. And so x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. And so the sum is 0, and 0 is not 3. So that checks. All right, so let's continue looking at potential problems. So now let's set yellow to be true, um, to be, uh, yeah, true. And so we have blue being false, dotted line, yellow being true, solid line. And so now we have not A, and B is less than 5. OK, so now we're going to go inside the yellow and see what happens. Well, we run into another branch. The branch we run into is magenta. All right, so what if magenta is false? If magenta is mm -hmm. false, then we run y, z equals 2. And so 0 plus 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 is not equal 3. So assertion does not fall, does not, uh, does not, does not trip. All right, and the final possibility is what if a is false, b is less than 5, and c is true? And so what we did here was we... <laughs> negated the, the, the purple condition. So um, that's 
in fact, consistent with the first one. So not A is true and also not A is true and, and C is true. So if that is true, then what happens is you have X equals zero because you didn't run the first one. You have Y equals one from magenta and then you run Z equals two. And so one plus two is three, we know that. And so the assertion does trip. And so we found a case where the assertion is um, the assertion does not hold, like x plus y plus z is in fact three, so it's not not three. And so we found a, a potential path where the assertion might be violated. And then what we do is we feed the result not a and b is less than five and c to the um, to z3. And z3 could tell us, you know, well, you know, set a to be false, set C to be true, so that's easy, and set B to be three, and then you'll get an execution that um, that will fail. Um, okay, A is false, B equals two, C equals true, also does that too, right. All right, so let's talk about using symbolic execution to find bugs. So what we have is we have this tool, Symbolic Execution. This tool enumerates paths. And so what it's going to do is it's going to run into mm -hmm. bugs that trigger whenever the path executes. And so what, what happens is you have your program and it has some assertions, it has some buffer overflows. And look, the program is not going to run into this assertion or this buffer overflow on all executions. That would be really easy to detect and you wouldn't really even need to bother using any technology at all to do that. You just need to run the program once and you'd be, you'd be finding all the bugs. But no, that's not what happens. And so symbolic execution is going to enumerate all the paths and allow you to feed the appropriate path to the program so that you can actually look at the bug yourself. So then what happens after we how do we use or how does symbolic execution actually work? We don't go into all details. And in fact, you know, Z3 is going to be a black box, but let's talk about how the symbolic execution part works. So you have this assertion. So for instance, assert X is not equal to null. And what happens is that the compiler is going to compile into a conditional. So that's for instance, if X equals null, then error. And the goal then in using symbolic execution is to show that the error is reachable or unreachable, right? And so we treat assertions, assertions as conditions. This creates explicit error paths and we search for these error paths and see that they're reachable or unreachable. And so then there's a bug if the error call is reachable. You don't ever want there to be an error. All right, so more generally, if you want to find problem properties of programs, then you instrument the program with the properties. And you can actually translate any safety property. There's a technical meaning of safety. And I guess I'll just briefly say that's like safety means that no bad thing happens. And so you can translate any such safety property into reachability. And um, this is the same approach as we used in fuzzing. So in fuzzing, we're like, okay, there's this bad thing and you don't want the bad thing to happen. And so we're going to try to, we're trying to reach it. But in fuzzing, it's using basically randomness and feeding random things into the program. Here, instead of using randomness, we're going to try to reason about the program and the conditionals. And we're going to be much more intentional about it rather than just using the million monkey theorem and hoping we get Shakespeare. This implementation of uh, instrumentation can either be implicit or explicit. So it is possible to explicitly instrument the code with checks. Uh, like with sanitizers, or it's also possible to do this implicitly. And so the symbolic execution engine can inject extra checks at runtime. So it means that you're not messing with the program until you run it. You don't need compiler support. Um, the engine itself can support it. And so another example of this is you're trying to detect division by zero errors. And so what you do is you do the division by potentially zero. But before that, you do an assert x is not equal to zero, which then can be translated to if x is equal to zero, then error. And um, and then you, you find the problem. Or you can do this buffer overflows as well in a very similar way as what we saw with the address sanitizer. So 
And here what we do is instead of writing a of x equals 10, when we execute it, then we run assert x is greater than or equal to zero. You don't want to allow negative indices and x is less than length of a. And also you say a of x equals 10, which should have been on the slide. All right, so symbolic execution, it sounds good. It's not super tractable as is. And so we're gonna track, we're gonna talk about ways of making it more tractable like dynamic symbolic execution. The issue is that some code is hard to analyze. Um, I've shown you things which are really actually quite simple, but you can have constraints that are just a little bit harder than that and they become super hard to solve and sometimes even provably hard to invert. There's also the path explosion problem. So the number of paths is actually literally exponential in the size of the program. We saw that with the programs that we, you know, branched out, right? You have one, you have one branch, two possibilities, two branch, four possibilities, um, 16 branches, 64K possibilities, and that becomes 65K. That becomes hard. Um, control flu, so loops, procedures, concurrency, all these things cause explosion. And so you're gonna have a bad time unless you have some some story about path explosion. And I just show you integers and booleans. Those are easy. I mean, there's still a lot of integers, but not that many. But you have pointers, data structures. How do you generate interesting data structures, which was an active area of research? Files, databases, threads, thread schedules, sockets. Ah, this gets hard. So it's an interesting technique, but needs a lot more work to make it practical. We will talk about some of this work in the next few weeks. Now that's that's lecture on symbolic execution. We'll also have a lecture about C3. Um, and I will try to record that tonight or tomorrow night. All right. See ya.